Hi everybody, my name is Jerry and this is week 8 of the Photo Africa Weekly Chat. Uh, it's been quite a week on this side, if you've been following the blog you'll see there's a lot of things happening. Uh, I still can't speak about it, we're very close though. Um, but when I was driving back to Madikwa yesterday, we had a couple of week, uh, a couple of days in Johannesburg, some meetings and I had to go and do some things. The driving back, head is all over the place, you're thinking about what's going to happen, where, where, what, what has happened. And I started going in the direction of emotions in photography and how your emotions influence what you shoot. For me personally, if I look back, uh, Adal and I, my wife Adal and I used to work on North Island in the Seychelles. Absolutely beautiful place. And at that stage I was, I was quite new to the whole photographic thing. Been shooting around a bit, but it ended up not being ideal for us and it was a very, I want to say dark, but quite, a, quite an unhappy time. If I look back at the images I created, then I, you imagine you've got, you've got palm trees, you've got beautiful beaches, I mean, some of the best beaches in the world right there. But if I look at the images I created, it was all dark and heavy. and So there's definitely a link between your emotions and what you photograph. Now, as I was driving back yesterday, I, I, I wanted to shoot this video in the car driving back. But the roads from Johannesburg up here to Madikwe, there's one section where it's not as much about missing the potholes as actually hitting the road. It's that bad. It would have bounced all over the place. Because driving back, you've got all these thoughts and things, and you can get the sunset, the open plains, Africa, and things. So, what I wanted to know, and I'd like to hear from you guys on this, is when you go out, I'm not talking game reserves now, just on your own into nature, wildlife, landscapes, do you shoot for your emotions? Do you look back afterwards and think, well, I've shot this, how was I feeling? Happy, sad? Because your colors, I mean, your red is a passionate color. Love or hate can be like blood as well. But um, how does your emotions influence what you look to photograph? Because it, it makes a difference. Uh, that also then, I just read an interesting article this morning when I opened my emails on inspiration. And some days you just feel moody and blue and you don't want to go out there. And you think, oh, I'm not inspired today. <laughs> according to, uh, I would like to believe, but according to this article as well, that's complete rubbish. Because the, the, the article was called, I'll, I'll give you a link to this, was called Amateurs, uh, Inspiration is for Amateurs. The idea being that if you really want to go out there and take pictures, <laughs> we're going into amateur and professional again, watch last week, no, um, is that if you want to go and take pictures, you don't need that inspiration. You can go out there with the intention of doing something and you will still be able to create something. You might not get what you intended to. You might not find the beautiful landscape, the lions hunting down something, or the elephants at the waterhole, but you'll find other things because you put yourself out there. And I think you'll start seeing there's a recurring theme here. I mean, for me, number one is sharing. We need to share what we do. Share your work with people and, um, and, and, and just go out there and do it. Even if you don't feel like it some days, beautiful way to clear your head, but by putting yourself out there, you'll be in a better position to create images. Maybe not what you set out to, but you will have something. You'll see something. I mean, many, many times, oh, oh, you're very inspired in the morning, and I grab the 400, the 600, the wide angles, and we head out there, and I find zip. And you come back and think, oh, shit, what a waste of a morning. It wasn't, because if you just look past what you're hoping to get, you're going to find some images, and that's the wonderful thing. Now, on images, just a quick one, is uh, Ilias sent me an image he took in Madikwe a while ago. International sent, sent me the image and he said, what do I think of this? Beautiful shot, first off on the email. Uh, it's a lioness yawning. That's about it. So, what I'm going to do for today's Lightroom, I'm going to talk through the image on Lightroom and we'll look at ways of, first, what Ilias has created and then what we can do with it. A crop, a color, black and white, removing, whatever the case is. So, let's look at the image, work through it in Lightroom, and then we'll talk about the rest of this chat just after this. So, Ilias's image in Lightroom, let's have a look. Right, uh, for today's Lightroom tutorial, we're not going to so much do a tutorial, rather than just look at a couple of options on an image. This line image on screen here is the one I was mentioning. Ilias sent this through and asked what we could do with this. Now, just to start off, very nice line nest yawning. If we look close, click once. Nice and sharp to start with, but it does look a bit washed out color-wise. This, I'm guessing, I can't see any information on this file, but probably a bit overcast. And then, yeah, Elias has sent a square crop, which very arty to start with. So, let's ignore the crop. I would have liked to see the full image and see what we can do with it, but let's play from here. First thing I would do immediately, start with contrast. 
click and hold. Remember, with all these sliders, right increases and moving to the left decreases. So watch the image as we keep on moving up. Nice bit of blacks coming through there. Right, let's keep it there. Brightness. I just want to get a little bit of detail in the edges of the black here. So just bring some brightness in as well. Right, now you can immediately see it starts blowing out a bit. You can see my histogram here leaning over. I haven't lost details yet, but visually not that appealing. So I'm going to drop the exposure of the entire image down a bit. All right, watch the histogram. This is also live. So as I watch the exposure up and down, my, my, my histogram jumps with us. All right, that's a bit better. All right, got some nice detail there. I'll automatically add a bit of vibrance in here. Just get a little bit of that punch color coming through. You'll see here a lot of color in the reds of the mouth here. Sure, lots of detail. All right, also the green's popping out a bit. All right, we've done a couple of things. We've added some contrast, some brightness, exposure. I dropped just a little bit to balance, which I think was probably an overcast feeling um, on this day. Then I would still like a bit of the dark edges to come through. So I'm going to use my black slider. Click and hold and just drag it very slightly. You'll see it punches it quite nicely. There we go. Without, even watch on the edges here. All the dark edges give us a little bit of black. Right, now we're getting somewhere. Right, we can see up here, I haven't got any blacks or whites um, that are creeping up the sides of my histogram, which means we're not losing any detail anyway. Now, on a square crop like this, what I would like to try is, obviously, my focus is in the center of the frame. Rule of thirds says we've got to keep it away from the center, but on a square crop, this can work. Also with this, well, let's face it, quite uh, hectic uh, subject we have in the middle, I'm going to try and even pull my viewer's eye even more into the center. We're going to do that by creating a slight vignette around the side. I'm going to close the basic panel. I'm going to scroll down to effects. Now, we haven't done this on, on the weekly chat, but let's give it a go. Click once. Amount. Right. Forget all of this. We'll get to that in detail for now. If I take the amount slider on my vignette down, watch the image, you'll see it gets darker around the side. Typical old-fashioned stuff there. And if we take it to the other side, it makes the edges lighter. So, we're going to just make it a little bit darker, but I don't want to have the obvious effect. So I come down to feathering, and I increase the feathering so that it blends in a bit better. Yeah, now you can almost not see it. Use my little switch here, click once. That's without the vignette. Click back, that's with. Right, last thing I would do to this image, as a processing point of view, go to detail, do a bit of my sharpening. I'm just going to play around for there. Let's zoom in, you can see the result. Right, that's zero. Watch the image in the main part, watch the detail, push the detail up a little bit. Right, there we're getting some. Click out, and now as per the previous tutorial, hold Alt while you use your mask and you pull up. Remember, the white areas get sharpened, the black areas do not. So I want to focus on, there's what I want to focus on. Let go. Done. That's my image. If I click on before and after down here, you can see on the left, the original image on the right hand side. A very quick process and that sorts that out for us there. Uh, the only thing I would have wanted to do here as well would be maybe to clone these things out. But then again, I don't like cloning in, a non, in, a, in, a, in wildlife images. It's natural. That's what it was. Elias, thanks. Great shot. There you go. Before and after. Back we go. Right, so, you see, many options, one image. I think what's interesting also from that point is if you can get used to shooting for your processing. I'm not saying shoot a rubbish photo, you're going to fix it, because the, the thing with Photoshop is still, you put crap in, you're going to get crap out. You can't fix everything. But if you keep in mind that you have that powerful tool that you can use, you've got Photoshop, you've got Lightroom, you've got Aperture, you can... Even in bad lighting situations, you can make something of it. So when you're out shooting and you think, oh, difficult situation, think, can I complete my digital process with, the, with Photoshop? That's what it's about. Because it's not just about clicking the shutter anymore. There's a whole process. You need to go out there, like we said earlier, you need to take the picture, which is you, your composition, your technical and your artistic ability, but you have to finish the process. You have to. In this last week, someone asked me, yes, but do people still... Uh, process their images. Absolutely, you have to. You absolutely have to finish the process to get the best out of the image. Uh, for me, I don't want to spend too much time per image because then, it's, then I'm turning into a computer person rather than a photographer. I would rather stick with photography and just work a bit on the side, but you have to. Have to, have to. And right, so 
a lot of this last week, what I had to do in Joburg, we had some planning and things for next year. This will all come into play soon. Yes, watch this space. The, um, we're looking at year calendars for next year of trips we want to do and stuff like that. And this got me thinking. Uh, on, I mean, I've got uh, two trips for 2012 and 2013 that I want to do. I want to go to Patagonia and Galapagos. Those are two of my big ones. I mean, I get to shoot Africa and I'm very lucky for that. And there are still areas in Africa I would like to go and do. But there's this photographic bucket list. So, send me your thoughts on this. What would be your on your photographic bucket list? If it's Africa, tell me where and why. That, I, I, I think this is also where we find inspiration. I, mean, I never thought, for example, of going to shoot great white sharks. Not shoot, shoot, photo, photograph. Great white sharks breaching. I've seen them on National Geographic and you can think, yeah, that's awesome. But you never think, you know what, I want to go photograph that. But now, after chats with Andrew Beck, partner of mine, and um, as it happened now, we've put this thing together and in about three weeks from now, we're going to photograph the great white shark breaching. And the more I think about it, it's like, why was that not on the list initially? So, I mean, I've got plenty. Oof. I want to deserts, I want to go Amazon, I want to do an Amazon shoot in the jungle, these kind of things. And, and share those experiences and those images with people. So, what is, your, what is on your photographic bucket list? Where would you like to go? But more importantly is why. It's all fine to say, you guys from the States, yes, I want to come to, uh, to, to, to Africa to photograph the Big Five. Why do you want to photograph the Big Five? Which, which one of them? All of them? And why? What, what are the images you want to create of your bucket list item? Or your, your bucket list destination? I think more than just an interesting conversation, that could also start leading to your own brain working. Because if you start thinking what you want to photograph, but more than that, and why, that is when you're going to start thinking of how you can portray that destination, that scene, that animal, that shark, that lion, gorilla, whatever it is, that's when you're going to start creating pictures in your mind and stories you want to tell through your photographs. That's where the inspiration comes from. So yeah, send me an email, drop me a list. Um, if you've been to places you want to go back to, why do you want to go back? And if you, if you go back there, what would you change? Would you do it differently? Would you shoot it differently? Uh, I'm in, in the next couple of weeks, I will, I, I'm going to put up a bucket list of my own where I, and it's not just wildlife. It's not just wildlife. Um, things like sunrise over uh, Morocco, Marrakesh, something like that. I don't know. Those are unique. It's visual things. Uh, we've been sunrise in Times Square for me. I mean, we from Africa, we don't have lions and stuff on the street. No, not really. <laughs> we, 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 I mean, I love going to cities, big cities. The energy and stuff's amazing. So to shoot sunrise in Times Square is something I would love to give a bash, give it a go. So anything, it doesn't have to be wildlife only. Give me your bucket list. Tell me what you want to go and photograph, and let's compare lists. Might make an interesting one. Also, to wrap up on is the conversation that we create. The, there's a couple of people who have been very active on the comments on, on, on the blog and it's a great thing because now we're starting to share links. There's people sharing links with each other. Fantastic. That's what it's about. If you look on a lot of the sites, you get a very, uh, lack of a better word, a bitchy thing. And this guy contradicts this one because he's wrong on this and that. So far, I think it's fantastic. We're sharing ideas, we're sharing links, we're sharing uh, images. And I think all along the way, we get inspired by all of this. So yeah, this was week eight. Next week, again from Adequa, I will see you then. I think probably by week 10, two weeks from now, I will be able to give you an update on what is happening, where, how, and why. Uh, very exciting stuff. A little bit scary as well, but it's huge. So, yeah, hang around. Week 10, we'll give you some updates. For now, check the links below the blog um, on Photo Africa. If you're watching this on YouTube, go to photoafrica.com. There's all the links. Send me your thoughts, your comments, your suggestions. Hook up on Facebook on the Photo Africa page. I'll have the link in there. Look me up on Twitter. Let's keep on sharing. Let's keep on inspiring. Have a good week. I will see you next week. Enjoy.